Well, thank you so much for joining me. I'm glad that we made this work. Glad to be here. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, I thought that we might kick off with um, some of the national narrative right now about what's happening with racial injustice at large. And I want your kind of hot take on how you think our industry is responding and if we've hit the right tone or not. Well, I, I put it this way, you know, the uh, social uh, uprising that we are seeing, which by the way, for me being an old guy is reminiscent when I was a little kid in the 60s. Um, yeah. But I think that what makes this one more unique is that it is uh, it, it was on video. The situation with George Floyd captured right. America's attention and the world's attention uh, to the unjust situation that was occurring. Um, you know, racial inequity is not a new issue in this country. Uh, it's been there for years. Uh, it may have taken a bit of a backseat or went underground a while, but it's been there. And so I think that this makes uh, the situations that we're uh, dealing with today I think the industry is poised to deal with it. Uh, what I'm really thrilled about it was how NAR, our state, our local associations, the brokers in this country, the agents in mass have gone forward and said, you know, we've got to make sure that we're doing things differently and better so that everyone is treated equally and fairly when it comes to housing, but even in society as a whole. Yeah. Well, I think about you saying um, this is not new to us. You said that on the MN stage too, and I think that's right. I think that's especially true for housing. Housing has been at the center of what many would consider uh, ca having caused systemic racism for so long. I mean, I think back to what we know about land use patterns and wealth building uh, following the redlining that happened so uh, almost everywhere across the country. And I think about what our role ought to be in recovering that. So NAR um, is putting action behind their words. You released a five point plan recently uh, aimed at helping to promote home ownership among the black community. And your number one tip, uh, your number one goal or tactic was to increase housing capacity. But there's a flip side to that. How do we, when I think of increasing housing capacity, I think about it as a GAD does. More density, uh, which can lead to gentrification. How do we increase capacity without displacing people that are building community in the folks that we're trying to serve? Yeah, I think a lot of it comes in uh, to, to bear, which is how we as an industry drive fairness in housing. You know, a couple mm -hmm. years ago, uh, we, we commemorated the 50th anniversary of the Fair Housing Law. Um, you know, in a, a, an interesting backdrop, Emily, um, I was involved before I became CEO with our multicultural groups. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was dealing with, and again, it was very mixed in terms of uh, Asian Americans and Hispanic Americans and Black Americans, uh, all in this multicultural group. And I remember we were talking about the 50th anniversary. And I said, you know what? NAR is going to promote it really hard. We're going to celebrate it. And I remember one of the leaders of the, uh, uh, of, of the, the group that represents, you know, Black Americans looked at me and said, Bob, we're not at, at a point yet where we can celebrate. Mm -hmm. We can commemorate, but we can't celebrate. And that just stuck with me because yes, it was an anniversary that was noted uh, two years ago, but it showed that we needed to do a whole lot more as an industry. I think what makes me the most proud uh, is that before uh, the, the George Floyd situation, before many people know about what happened in Long Island uh, with the newspaper catching uh, some, some bad actors uh, from our industry, uh, we hired a gentleman named Brian Green as our director of Fair Housing. He came from HUD. Uh, I actually hired Brian many, many months before any of those other things happened because I felt it was important for us as a national association to double down on putting actions behind our words that you mentioned. You know, we needed to have someone that could be the leader carrying the gauntlet that says, if NAR and our industry is serious about fair housing and justice, then we got to have someone that leads the act. So to your point, which is it's more than just a slogan, it's got to be that we're doing actions in the industry to make sure that there's opportunity for Black Americans, minority Americans in the housing area. Uh, we created a program called the ACT program, uh, A-C-T in our fair housing area. It stands for accountability, culture change, and training. Now, all of those are imperative. Uh, training is probably the most important thing we got to do in the short term. 
So we just released a series, if you go to NAR.realtor, uh, implicit bias training and video, about a 50 minute video, uh, getting you know, rave reviews around the country from agents themselves. Uh, but we're also putting together other programs where brokers can do testing programs. Uh, we're not gonna talk a lot about it, but it is happening. And when I say not talking about it, we don't want to sit there and say, well, this broker's doing this test and this broker's doing this test. These brokers are stepping up and doing it randomly to see how their agents in their office are responding in real life situations with testers to say, are they handling this in a fair manner? So, yeah. you know, you've got to do a lot of things and we're working with our state and local associations like yourself to bring those programs to life. Yeah, I mean, I think definitely as I think about the tools that you've provided for brokers, that is such an important place because they're just not prepared, all of them, to, pr to assess the proper policies and procedures for managing interactions, not just with clients externally, but in terms of the interactions that happen with their own agents in, inside their own offices. So I, I, I've seen the video. I think it was a really good resource, and I know that there's probably more to come behind that. I want to turn us a little bit now just to the larger picture of NAR. Um, I want to share with you that ABOR's done some work. So in Austin, we've had a lot of conversations about the differences between what an association is versus what an MLS is. Um, they are not one and the same as our belief, and I would expect probably yours. Uh, their competencies are very different. What makes an MLS really good is not what makes an association really good most times. But um, in, at NAR, those waters are a little muddy still. And so I wonder, uh, you know, as, as I think about the role that the MLS Policy Committee plays, your role in the industry at large, and how that parallels with the role of CMLS, I kind of wonder what you think about that. How different are the two entities for you? Well, I think they're similar in one way. We serve the common member. Uh, there are mutual members who have an expectation of being served, uh, but the services are different. Now, an MLS, and by the way, you're talking to an old MLS guy. Maybe I should yeah. say old, but uh, I grew up <laughs> in this Don't industry. date yourself. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I grew up in this industry being a, uh, from a major MLS vendor, uh, the largest in the country at the time. And, uh, you know, there's, a, there's an expectation by the members that MLS is there to be uh, an opportunity for listings to be shared cooperatively um, and that it it really benefits the consumer by virtue of the fact that a seller's listing is exposed to as many people possible. Your listeners know what MLS is. Yeah. The association actually has a whole set of different services uh, th that range from education and training and benefits and, and advocacy, all of the above of what an association is supposed to do to help their members prosper, gather, network, be educated, etc. Where they blend is, and this is something that I work really hard to try to explain to people, I think one of the core responsibilities that NAR has is to be the driver of technology and to bring technology as a benefit to our members. You know, a lot of people, Emily, don't realize that NAR has a major play in technology advancement. Uh, when I came in as CEO about three years ago, uh, I created a strategic business innovation technology group. And that group was to be there to look at all the major technological changes happening in the industry and how do we position NAR in our industry? And when I say NAR, I don't mean just us as an entity. NAR is all the realtors in this industry combined together is the National Association of Realtors. And how do we bring these technology players to the table so that we're not fearful of them but we're fearless. We bring them to the table. We say, what can we do to better enhance what realtors do on behalf of consumers? How do we bring technology to help improve the ROI of our members and our brokers and our associations? How do we do all of these things and be the leaders as opposed to the followers? And so we have a program that, uh, that I used to run before I became CEO called Second Century Ventures and Reach. Uh, mm -hmm. Reach is an accelerator program. I'll guarantee you the majority of the people listening to this podcast don't realize that NAR has an equity ownership in over 112 technology companies. I mean, that's right, 112 companies that are in the technology business, we have a piece of the action. And we didn't get involved from an investment perspective 
for the purposes of what's going to be the ROI for us. We got involved so that we could help influence our industry to be realtor advocates instead of realtor uh, adversaries. One of our first investments was in a company called uh, DocuSign. You know, we just a, we li- just a little treat- company. <laughs> yeah, a little company. Uh, <laughs> but we saw eight to 10 years ago that electronic signatures need to be a play. Not that it might be, we need to drive it so e signatures are there. Uh, we're now involved, a lot of people don't realize with the COVID situation, how do we do electronic closings and notaries? Well, NAR many years ago invested in a company called Notarize and Notary Cam. There's two companies. Our point being is we're doing these things so that we can help our members succeed without having someone dictate to us how we're supposed to be successful. And more importantly, making sure that we're not being disintermediated because we're sitting on our butts doing that. Yeah, so that makes sense to me that it's a competency of the association to drive both adoption of technology within the industry, to make that adoption fluid, to create technology that um, doesn't, take the agent out of the transaction, but puts them at the center of it in the ways that they are good at what they do and automates the stuff that they're not as good at doing. Um, but, but I want to talk again about that line between the MLS and the association. You know, when I think about uh, the, the way that the MLS policy committee works, the, the value that it holds as it pertains to local MLSs, you know, it's directly associated with our e insurance as we're under the same umbrella. Do you consider the business of the MLS to be a competency of the association or is it a parent-child relationship? What does that look like for you? I th- well, I think it varies depending on where you are in the country. Um, sure, you know, there's lots of area, models. Every area works differently. The models are different. That's why we are a uh, big supporter with CMLS. Uh, yeah. We've been involved with them for several years. You know, I think years ago, there used to be a perception, real or not, I'll leave it at that, that NAR and the MLSs were actually just clashing with each other as to who the dominant players should be in this. Uh, and I guess maybe myself coming from a background in MLS, I see a clear distinction of what the association should be providing and what MLSs provide. And like I mentioned earlier, they are the same mutual customer in most cases, but we have to make sure that the MLSs are independent enough so that they can do what's in the best interest of the buyers and the sellers as consumers. They're also independent enough to be able to serve the players in the, in the participants in the business without there being over governance by an association perspective. Now, the governance components are important in terms of making sure that there's fairness of cooperation and compensation, uh, that there's the right amount of training. Many times associations may be doing that training. How does it involve uh, an interplay with like lock boxes, et cetera? Mm-hmm. But I think there's a clear distinction uh, where, and that's why you typically in a lot of areas have a separate MLS committee and then a separate board of directors of a local MLS. And uh, it, there are different models. Some are realtor-owned associations with realtor-owned MLSs. And then there's some that are independent MLSs that are uh, totally arm's length and have nothing to do specifically with the association. Yeah, I do. I, I think we've come a long way as an industry, I guess, in terms of managing that that tenuous dance, that tension that's been there between MLS and association. And I think I think it's beneficial, frankly, more so to the association than anything if we define that separation better, because then we know what we stand for and we know our value proposition separate and independent, which I think is a place of strength. Um, whereas I think some view that as a as a fearful potential. And I've said, Emily, even when I came in, I knew there was some contention when I came in as CEO between some MLSs with some of the activities NER was doing. And I, I really do feel that MLS as being the glue that holds the business side together needs to have the autonomy without NAR or a state or a local in the middle of it. Yeah. Um, I've all, and I've said from day one, as long as I'm CEO, NAR not, will not be playing in the MLS business because I came from that and I don't know any reason why NAR would ever want to be in that business. Yeah, it's not fun some days, but, <laughs> but it's great others. It just depends yeah. on, the, on the hour. Um, okay, so let's talk. So we talked a little bit about what you're not. Let's uh, talk about what you are. How do you concisely uh, project what the value proposition of NAR is? Who, how would you tell a stranger? Well, I would say, first of all, the benefits that we provide in association is unlike anything else that anybody can get. Now, what does that mean? 
Well, at the NER level, the annual dues are $150 a year. And I would argue that's the best deal in town. That's separate from a $35 special assessment that pays for the ad campaign. But when you look at the, how we break down that $150, and again, that's annually, uh, the, what we do on Capitol Hill alone pays for that tenfold. And we can talk about it in a few minutes about some of the things with the CARES Act, the NER drove, puts more money in members' pockets based on pandemic unemployment insurance, the, uh, the, the special uh, loan programs with the PPP program. NER was the driver behind that representing independent contractors. But if you look at just the, uh, the collective components of it, you know, we have a program called our Realtor Benefits Program, uh, where we have 30 plus companies that provide benefits and services just because, based on our size and the opportunity to negotiate and leverage a big audience of people. Uh, we have one of the most successful affinity programs. I mean, look at like our Chrysler program and Jeep program, uh, just to highlight one of them. You know, as, you're, as a realtor, and we have thousands of realtors that do this program every year, you save $500 on top of your best deal. No matter what you negotiate, and you can say, oh, by the way, I'm a realtor. You get an additional $500 and two years of service. And Chrysler confirmed from, it's actually FCA, Fiat Chrysler Corporation, uh, that if we were a dealer, we'd be the, in these top 10 largest dealers in the United States. That shows the buying power that we have as an AR, and it shows the interest that members have taking advantage of it. The FedEx program, you know, the dollars you save on our national FedEx program, if you did 10 packages a year, paid your national dues. The point being is associations, and by the way, I'm sure you've got local association benefits. I know the states have them. The fact that collectively between the local, the state, and the national has so many different opportunities for a member because our members being independent contractors have to rely on their association in most cases to be their business negotiators. Uh, you look at what we're doing in technology and all the tools that we're bringing as an association with hundreds of companies that can provide these uh, benefits that improve the ROI of every uh, agent in this country. Uh, you look at our, ad, uh, I mentioned advocacy, our education programs, uh, you know, a multitude of certifications and designations to help better each of the members. You know, that's what associations are all about is to be there. And when it becomes most evident is when you look at a crisis that we're going through right now with a pandemic, there is no greater value than your association and all the tools and services that all three at the local, state, and national level collectively are bringing to service the members. Do you think they turn to us though? I, I mean, I, I, I could definitely spat off the benefits of Avon. would love to do that with my members <laughs> at any given chance. But, but I also know that there are many, many, many of them who have no idea what we do. And they really don't understand the difference between me and the MLS or me and their broker sometimes. Like, you know, boil it down. Because I, I would agree the pandemic has shown a bright, bright light on the yeah. value of advocacy work at the association. But what else is at the core that is the nugget that keeps us connected to our members? Well, I think, you know, I, I'll say think one thing a little different here. Um, yeah. Before the pandemic, we had 800,000 members a year using one or more of our benefits products. I mean, 800,000. So talk about engagement, 70 plus percent of our members are using any of our benefits products and services. Now, what's really amazing in that is I wish we had that percentage in our advocacy area and grassroots contributions of how do we influence policy in this country. And we are very powerful in that area, but I'd like to see a 70% engagement as well. No doubt. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think one of the things that, like you said, we all struggle as an association to get our members mind share. You know, right now, um, you know, in, in this day and age, I'm not talking about the COVID day and age, just in general, you know, between social media and news and fake news and what you read here or what you see there, it's hard to capture the mind share of any of us as human beings. So you don't have the time to say, how do we get a member to really focus on what, Emily, you're doing in Austin for them or what Travis is doing in, 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 at the Texas level or what NAR is doing? That is the biggest challenge that we've had. And I thought the magic answer, candidly, to be able to boil down what our number one or two core benefit is, was to get involved in social media. 
But even that is so noisy and crowded now. Um, yeah. The new norm, which I now say is the norm, are doing things like this. Uh, I have been engaging with our leadership with more members on a day-to-day -day basis than we ever have in the history of NAR. You yeah. know, to give you some perspective, uh, between Vince and myself and our leadership team, we've done hundreds of these Zoom meetings in front of hundreds of thousands of members where we get a chance to not only engage with our members, but more importantly, listen to what our members have to say. And yeah. so even today, I've had three meetings with local boards where they never would have heard and seen the, the CEO before unless I happen to be at an event or my predecessors were there. So now we can actually uh, talk to our members about what's important for them. So when I sit there and say, well, the number one thing we do is advocacy or the number two thing we do is technology, for a member you know, just sitting there, that may not be important at all. They may only care about this designation that they're doing, or they may only care about some other aspect of what an association brings. So instead of trying to tell them a hundred things, let's listen to what they have to say and answer directly the types of benefits and services that will make them happy. And I've had more people sit there and tell me, wow, I had no idea that NER did this, but here's, I think, something that we should point out here, that for the first time we're being able to show our members how a state and a local and a national work together in the three-way agreement. So having you as a local association, as a CEO, and the NER CEO together, we can actually engage with members and say, here's what your local's doing for you, here's what your state's doing, here's what national's doing, and here's how we're all working together. Because in the past, it was, well, I pay my dues, I know some of it goes to NER, some of it goes to the state, and I could, and the average member couldn't tell you five things that any one of them do for them. And now we're able to engage them in such a way to say, what's important to you and what can we do to help make that better so that it validates the importance of the dues that you're paying? Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree. You know, we, I, it was worked a lot on member engagement and it's shifted culturally for us a lot over the last year. And one of my biggest worries going into the shelter in place was that we were going to lose touch with our members after we'd worked so hard to get regain their trust again, frankly, after several tumultuous years. But um, I, it's been surprising and really wonderful to see the amount of engagement that's stemmed from this. I mean, we've absolutely connected with more people. I can put more people on a Zoom webinar all day long and not just in Austin but from all over the place um, in a program that would have only sat 100 last last year. Well, so. And I think the best case of that is, because I was like you, I was wondering, oh, now we've got staff sitting, you know, we have 350 employees. Oh, no, I know, I knew they'd be working, but. <laughs> all employees, different places. We have two major call centers. By yeah. the way, 4,000 calls a week at our call centers. And they're all at different locations now around the country because they're not in a call center. We're right. engaged more today than we ever have. And I right. sit there and I say, wow, why were we doing this before? I mean, every I week we hold a meeting with the state association executives, with my senior team, with the leading, well, all 50 plus states, and we talk about issues that are happening in, in local communities, what's going on at the state level, and how national can better support them and vice versa. Yeah. And I'm looking at it going, why did it take a pandemic for us to yeah. get on to I mean, if you think about it? So every, yeah, well, it's the same way a consumer is wondering why virtual showings weren't an option before, but, you know, yeah. because we evolve when we're pushed to our limits to some degree. And, and this know. will not be that when this passes, that it will go back to what it was. I do not believe for a second. I agree. Uh, you know, the best example I can give is we had our legislative meetings a month ago. Yeah. They typically get eight to 8,500, 8, 9,000 people in person to go lobby on the Hill for our issues. We did our first virtual conference and we had 28,000 people registered, fully engaged in participating in committee meetings and uh, seminars and speakers. And now we've been doing virtual Hill visits so that the congressperson is actually engaging with more of our members on a Zoom conference call than we ever had when they walked up on the Hill. And you look yeah, at that, I just came from one, so I can attest to that, <laughs> literally. It is amazing. We said, you know, um, you know, I have this uh, debate with my leadership team all the time, and we've been talking about this, and, you know, uh, when we do an annual conference, and uh, you usually get 20, 25,000 people in that, what happens if we do an annual conference that's a hybrid where maybe you only get ten or 15,000 to show up in person, but you get 100,000 people engaged online with Zoom videos, 
wow, that's the answer to it all. I'd rather exchange in person, uh, physically being there for more engagement with members where they can look and hear and see and comment and have a perspective and get more engaged with their association. Yeah, so I totally agree with that. One of the things I've been kind of thinking about as a long-term takeaway is what does it mean when the boundaries of our associations aren't defined by our geography any longer because everything moves so virtual? So what if the culture of the Austin Board of Realtors is what led to people wanting to be a member here as opposed to them having to be in my market? And how does that push our current structure, which is generally built on really old geographical boundaries? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, interestingly, what's occurring right now is that NER put together a couple of years ago a governance pact, uh, yeah. a presidential advisory group, whose sole job it is is to look how the association at the national level is governed. How do we make it so it's faster, more efficient, more engaging? Wow, guess what's happening now? We're relooking at what the committee has been working on, saying, you know, yeah. engagement can work a lot different, and you don't need to be sitting in a room coming up with how to engage and govern, what you look at now is expediency and how to make things happen faster than ever before because the customer, any our customer is our members, your customers are the members, and consumers demand faster answers and not having to wait. Yeah, no, I, I, I can only imagine that the work of the governance pack has shifted somewhat over the last couple yeah. of months. And it, it's big work anyway. It's big and, and very political work in this business. So uh, I appreciate that they're having to kind of retake a look at what they've done. So let's wrap up here. You are, you have and, and uh, are a strong leader and have been in our industry a really long time. You've seen lots of different things, but what what's your biggest takeaway from the experience we've just been through? And what's the long game at NAR from that takeaway? Yeah, I think the, uh, the, the biggest experience I've touched on it is a different way for us to engage and listen to our member. And I keep using the word listen for a reason. Uh, You know, I I give this uh, expression, I said, there's a reason that God has given us two ears and one mouth. Um, (laughs) Maybe I need to even personally practice that better. But when I'm engaging with hundreds of members on a Zoom call that have never engaged one-on-one with a CEO or with any of our leader, you know, our leadership team is so involved now their roles have changed. So it's not about traveling to 100 places. So I think what the takeaway is, is that we we need to leverage and how do we grow this opportunity to be more important for industry and for accessibility? Uh, Mm -hmm. How do we make change happen? Instead of saying, well, we heard in this area, uh, there was an issue with maybe something in fair housing. You know what? Let's put the key leaders on the the, uh, screen and let's talk about what worked what doesn't work, and what needs to change now, and how do we get the real estate commissions more involved with us, and let them sit in front of a meeting. You know, you asked before about how to double down and make real change. You know, you got to have people like the real estate commissions get involved with us as an industry, too, to say, Mm -hmm. you know what, if there's an issue, we got to double down and do something about it, and Mm -hmm. so I think that the the takeaway is is leveraging all these opportunities, Um, and I'll close with one other item. You know, we launched this program, Right Tools, right now, which provides these great benefits to our members. It's, uh, in, if people want to know, it's nar.realtor slash rtrn. But we made available hundreds of products. Uh, over 150,000 members in eight and a half weeks have taken a free or substantially discounted product and saved themselves almost $16 million. Wow. Now, that is just unprecedented how fast that's happened. So what do we learn from that? You know, instead of just marketing stuff or talking about these great benefits, how do we collectively work with our locals, our states and our nationals to put a collective package together and get on a screen and educate a member, do more broker meetings. I've been doing more broker meetings and broker uh, every Tuesday with their sales meeting. And they've never had leaders from any are there. Vince Malta, myself, uh, Charlie, Charlie Oppler, uh, you know, certainly with Leslie, who's coming up, all of us are engaged in these kind of conversations. And so I think that's the takeaway, is that they get to see who we are as real people. They can see that our motives are all pure, which is we're trying to help the member. And if the member tells us we're not helping them, 
did damn well, we ought to be listening to it and change our direction instantly versus let's go do a survey. Now, I can say, no, I had 500 people on a call and they were looking at me and they told me to follow it, you know. Yeah, That's the staff cool. knows the difference when you've gotten off the call and <laughs> the member told right. you directly, we're going to fix right. that problem. <laughs> right, it, it changes that entirely. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap up. Let me thank you on behalf of at least our market for all that you do for us. You know, I, it's a special relationship that we have in this industry at all three levels. And I, I value that, that you are always at the table with us. So thank you. Uh, it's been my pleasure and honor and privilege to be able to engage with you and the members. And more we can do this, I'm happy to do it.